very needful in our day and uh, learning how God wants us to pray. So in Luke chapter number 11 uh, is where we'll be drawing our attention. And I want us to see the big picture here in Luke chapter 11 and then probably our next Sunday night when we deal with this matter of prayer we'll be looking in Matthew's account because Matthew gives greater detail to it. Uh, but I chose to use this because here in this text, the disciples came and asked Jesus specifically to teach them to pray. So Luke chapter number 11 in verse number 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is, a, is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, I ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh shall be opened. And if a son uh, shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he... Uh, for a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? This afternoon, I want to deal with this truth. Lord, teach us to pray. Let's pray. Father, as we bow in Your presence, it is grateful uh, hearts that we are grateful to be back in your house this afternoon. Thank you, Lord, for the good day, the good Sunday school time, uh, Lord, the morning worship. And now, Father, as we enter into our evening service, we pray your blessings be upon it. Thank you so much already for the sweet songs of Zion that we've sang and enjoyed the atmosphere of worship. But, Lord, as it comes time for preaching, Lord, I need your help. Help me to rightly divide the word of truth. May your spirit be amongst us, working in our hearts and lives. Open our ears. Open our hearts. Uh, Lord, clear our minds of everything else. It's, uh, our minds are running through about what we're going to have to do this afternoon or the work week that's coming up. Father, help us be focused upon you. And Father, work in our hearts and lives. And Father, as these disciples ask of you to teach them to pray, I ask you the same, Lord, because I want to pray like you prayed. I want my prayers to be heard. I want my prayers to be answered according to your will. Lead and bless now, and we'll give you glory for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So reading, I spend a lot of time reading dead preachers. I mean, they're dead. They've been gone. But their works still live on. That's how old-fashioned I am. Most of my heroes' bodies are in the grave. <laughs> and this is what Thomas Brooks said about the matter of prayer. I thought it very, very compelling for me to read this. And so 
Uh, this, this Puritan pastor of the name Thomas Brooks wrote, The power of religion and godliness in, li uh, in godliness lives, thrives, or dies as our closet prayer lives. <laughs> godliness never rises to a higher pitch than when men keep closest to their closets. Private prayer is that secret key of heaven that unlocks all the treasures of glory to the soul. The best riches and the sweetest mercy God usually gives to His people when they are in their closets upon their knees. The graces of the saints are enlivened and cherished and strengthened by the sweet secret influences which their souls fall under when they are in their closet communing with God. God. Matthew's account of this, this, this pattern of prayer is he says, when you pray, enter in your closets. So in other words, our public praying flows from our private praying. Because the problem with public praying is we're more prone to pray to make people think, oh, what an elegant, good prayer he prayed. And if you're praying like that, you might as well sit down. Our prayer gets us an audience with God. We're talking to the Father. I don't care who's around, who's in this audience. I'm seeking an audience with God. And if you don't spend time in your closets, in your prayer life, you have no power, you have no joy, you have no victory, you have no peace, you have none of the fruits of the Spirit because we are failing in our closets. What's done in secret and private, God says, I will see you in secret and I will reward you so. Prayer is more than just a duty for the believer. It's the way of life. One of the greatest uh, verses in all the scriptures, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, he says, pray without ceasing. How is that a possibility? I can't be in my closet 24-7. Right? I can't always be with my eyes closed and my head bowed, pray, but I can in my mind think on God and talk to God while I work on the job, while I drive down the road. This thing about being born again, it's not a religion I get to practice on Sundays and Wednesdays. I have a vital living relationship with the thrice holy God who rules and reigns from heaven, who resides in me, who bought me with His blood, who's given me a new life, who's changed changed my affections, who's changed my desires, who's made me a new creature, and He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. And so, as I began to study the New Testament, I, I give you several commands about prayer. If you're taking notes, you can jot them down. In Matthew 26, 41, we're commanded to watch and pray. Luke 18, 1 he says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. <laughs> Romans 12, 12 says, continuing instant in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18 saying, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. So we're to pray always. And he says, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Jude talks about praying in the Holy Ghost. We need Spirit-filled praying. Colossians 4.2 says continue in prayer. And as I've already quoted, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Let us pray without ceasing. Amen. Who is our supreme example in the Bible? The Lord is. In the Lord's life, you find the Lord always slipping away to pray. Uh Prayer permeated our Lord's earthly ministry. And listen to these New Testament places I found about where Jesus prayed. In Luke 3, 21, He prayed at His baptism. Luke 5, 17, He prayed during His first preaching tour. Luke 6, 12-13, He prayed before choosing the twelve. Matthew 14, 
Verse 19 and 23, he prayed before and after feeding the 5,000. Matthew 15, 36, he prayed before feeding the 4,000. In Luke 9, 18, before he prayed before Peter's confession of Christ. In Luke 9, 28 through 29, he prayed at his transfiguration. Matthew 19, 13, he prayed for the little children that had been brought to him. In Luke 10, 21, he prayed after the return of the 70. In Luke 11, 41 through 42, he prayed before raising Lazarus from the dead. John 12, 28, he prayed as he faced the reality of the cross. Matthew 26, verses 26 and 27, he prayed at the Last Supper. And then in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 44, he prayed in Gethsemane. And later in Matthew 27, he would pray from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. John 17 is Christ's high priestly prayer. John 17 is the real Lord's Prayer. What I've read to our hearing in Luke 11 that's found in Matthew 6 is not the Lord's Prayer because the Lord did had no need to pray that prayer because He was not a sinner. We're the sinners. John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. Luke 11 and Matthew 6 is the disciples' prayer. It's our prayer as His example, His pattern. All I'm trying to get our minds to is that when you study the life of Jesus, Jesus was always praying. Matter of fact, He had certain places, certain times, and He made prayer a priority in His life. And if Jesus, the Son of God, who became the Son of Man, made prayer a priority in His life, how much should we? How much should we? If God in the flesh needed to pray, how much do you and I need to pray as sinners in the flesh? Mm -hmm. Very, very convicting and challenging as we look at this prayer. So notice with me in Luke 11 in verse number 1, we'll get to our first point. It says, And it came to pass that as He... Jesus was praying in a certain place when he ceased one of his disciples said unto him Lord teach us to pray hmm. as John also taught his disciples so the very first thing that I want us to see in this matter of Lord teach us to pray is nothing more than the prayer of Christ that compels this disciple to want to learn to pray and how to pray. You understand that? That's your number one point. It is the actual prayer of Christ that convicts this old boy, that challenges this old boy, and actually compels him. Lord, teach me to pray. Teach us to pray. Could you imagine being there, actually hearing Jesus pray? Wonder what it was like. I know probably what it was like. That one disciple was sitting there thinking, we don't know nothing about prayer. Listen to this. Listen to this man pray. That's how I need to pray. That's how I want to pray. That's how God demands us pray. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So it's actually the very prayer of Jesus that says, this disciple says, Lord, teach us to pray like that. Notice he didn't say teach us how to pray. He says, Lord, teach us to pray. There's a big difference. Lord, we need to have this same desire. You have to commune with the Father in prayer. And he says, Lord, we need that and will you teach that to me? You know what else I find interesting when this disciple says, Lord, teach us to pray. He waited till Jesus got done praying. In other words, he didn't interrupt Jesus' prayer. He waited until he was done. He said, Lord, teach us to pray. What's interesting to me, you'll never find the disciples saying, Jesus, teach me to preach like you preach. You never find them saying, Lord, help me to cast out devils like you cast out devils. You never ask him, Lord, help us to heal the sick like you heal the sick. Out of all the things the disciples could desire, they wanted to know how to pray and to pray like Jesus. 
You know why? Because they connected the dots and realized Jesus was able to do what He done because He stayed in communion with the Father. You remember Jesus gave the disciples power to cast out devils and heal the sick, those apostles, in His day. He gave them a power to do all that and the day came, it was available to them and they couldn't do it. And what did Jesus said, This kind of power only comes by Praying and fasting. I, I just wonder if we really grasp what prayer is. We've got our ideas about what prayer is. And I tell you, our ideas about prayer is wrong. For the most part. Jesus tells us in Matthew that we'll see later on, don't make vain repetitions. Every week, week in, week out, if you're not careful, you'll catch yourself praying the same prayer over and over and over again. Jesus said, don't do that! If you're not careful, prayer becomes a form instead of faith. It becomes a religion instead of a relationship. Oh yeah. They, they realize the effectiveness of prayer in Christ's life and they realize Jesus was effective as a man. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. He's the only person that ever has been or ever will be like that. But as a man, the man side of God had to stay in constant prayer in order to subdue that flesh he was in because he was tempted like you and me, yet without sin. He suffered like you and me, yet he did not sin. He didn't give up. He didn't have a pity party. You get the idea? So, well, it's impossible. No, it's not impossible. Jesus said in this world you'll have tribulation but be of good cheer for I've overcome the world. And he says on top of that I'm sending the comforter to you that's going to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. <laughs> and he says I'm going to guide you into all the truth. And if we are to be spirit-filled, spirit-led so our prayer life are to subdue this flesh because the flesh hates praying. Because it kills everything we used to be and everything the flesh is. That's why you struggle so hard getting in your closet. Because part of you says, I don't want to. And the Spirit's saying, get in there. So it's important for us to realize that. But I would go a step further and it's the disciples who recognize Jesus' pure desire to commune with God. But if I really was to probe in your prayer life, and if you'd be honest, 90% of the time the only reason you pray is because you've got a need. Don't get, don't get quiet now. We're trying to get something out of God instead of getting God. We want what He has to offer. We just don't want Him. That's the problem. And as you're going to find out toward the end of this, in verse 13 of Luke 11, He tells us that if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit to them that I... You know what Matthew says? Matthew calls it, how much more is he going to give good gifts to them that ask him? Why did Luke say the Holy Spirit? He's writing to Gentiles at this moment, and guess what? The Gentiles would have said, ooh, gimme, 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 gimme. That's why Luke puts the Holy Spirit. Because if all you're trying to do is get something out of God without getting God, you're wasting your breath. here. So these things are important. It says Jesus was in a certain place. And as Jesus was in this certain place, folks, Jesus had designated places that He prayed. You need a specific place you pray. 
whether it's a prayer garden, whether it's an office, whether it's a room, you need a designated place where you can slip away from society, from social media, from your siblings, from your spouse, from your offspring, and you and law God get along in private communion. We live in a generation nobody wants to be alone, much less get along with God. That's why we're not seeing God do what He used to do. Nobody wants it. If we did, we'd be in our closets. There's something wrong with our want to's. So, Jesus is teaching that there needs to be a designated place at a specific time. When I find about the life of Jesus, sometimes He'd rise up early in the morning, great while before day, and go pray. Other times He would stay up all night praying. All night. Sacrificing. Subduing that flesh. I mean, we live in a time where people struggle getting out of bed. Just to do the common mundane practice of life. And guess what? Because we don't make a prayer priority, we go through 24 hours a day and we barely pray. And the only time I promise that a lot of us do pray is when we pray over our food and ask God to bless it. This is the honest to God's truth, folks. When you study Jesus' life and you study the life of the disciples and you see the church in the book of Acts, you find something different than what we got. One old preacher said the church is dying on its feet because it stopped living on its knees. Man, you can't change the world, but we got a God who can. We spend all of our time worrying and wasting our time when we ought to be praying about it. We spend more time gossiping about the problems than we do praying to God about them. Now I know this is rough. This is hard. But we need to hear this. Because we have gotten away from praying. And this is why this disciple comes and he realizes, Lord, I need you to teach us to pray. Now Jesus didn't just slip away Every time there was a crisis, sometimes everything was perfectly okay and he'd slip away early in the morning just to commune with God. But the only time we want to get serious with prayer when things ain't going our way. Jesus is not your spare tire and he's not your co-pilot. That's right. <laughs> Jesus is it. He's the essence of my being. Paul told him at uh, there uh, in Mars Hill, it's because of God we exist and move and have our being. And if we're going to be spiritual, and if we're going to be different than the world, it ain't about a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's about living in the presence of God. The early church had this saying, it's called Corum Deo, and it's Latin for living in the face of God. Whether they went to work or wherever they did, they lived in each and every moment and based every decision they made throughout the day by prayer and realizing it was God seeing all things. That they could not hide from God. Now we live in a society people are living for facades and they put on the veneers and they shine up on the outside but deep inside they're a total different person than what they appear to be. That is called hypocrisy. That is play acting and Jesus condemns it. And you're not going to get anywhere with God being like that. Nobody wants to be vulnerable. Guess what? We're all vulnerable. And I have no problem saying I need Jesus. Amen. And I have no problem saying you need Jesus. And I have no problem saying this world needs Jesus. Then why ain't we praying? The reason the Lord done this is because He's in the human body. And He led by example on how to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
Oh, but He was God. Oh, I agree. But who did He give us? The Holy Spirit. And last time I checked, the Holy Spirit's God. He's not some force. He's not just some power. He's a person. The third person of the Godhead lives within us and God has already equipped us with everything that we need to help us live a victorious Christian life by faith. By faith. And you can't be living by faith when you're not praying. The third thing that I want to say here in verse number 1, and he also brings up at the last part of verse number 1, as John also taught his disciples. Lord John the Baptist taught his disciples, Lord, surely you will take time to teach us. Isn't it amazing how they draw this parallel that they see John teaching disciples and they knew Jesus needs to teach his disciples? And you know what they say when they come and say, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. First thing, they're admitting their inability. They're admitting their need. They're admitting they need to be taught. We live in a day where nobody needs to be taught. I know it all. You don't know how long I've been saved. You don't know how long I've been in church. That don't mean you're praying right. <laughs> that don't mean you got it right. Don't mean you got it right. If you're unteachable, that's not a work of the Spirit. That's a work of the flesh. It's called stubborn, hard-hearted, hard-headed. That's being a goat, not a sheep. So, they experience hearing Jesus pray and they say, that's how we need to pray. They say, Lord, teach us to pray. Now in verse number 2 to verse number 4, getting this next point of emphasis, not only it was Christ praying that compels these disciples to want to pray and to be taught how to pray and taught to pray, but the second emphasis is that we see the pattern of Christ that teaches them to pray and how to pray. Notice what he says in verse 2. And he said unto them, he said unto them, when you pray, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Let's just stop. Verse 2 and 3. It gives us plenty. What is the very first thing according to this pattern when we're praying? What are the very first things God tells us, Jesus tells us that we need to do and pray? First thing that we need to recognize our Father, which is where? In heaven. And what you'll find is that the very first four things Jesus says when we start our prayer, it should be acknowledging who we're talking to. We're not just talking to... He's not the man upstairs. <laughs> He's God. And if you're born again, He is our Father. And He lives in heaven. Okay? So when we dress, our Heavenly Father. That's how we pray. Dear Heavenly Father. He's teaching our Heavenly Father. So that is the emphasis. Prayer ain't about you. And it ain't about me. It's about the one we're talking to. Our attention and our focus should not be the crisis that I am, but it should be that we have a Father who cares that has rent the veil and made us where we have access to a God who loves, who cares, and has the ability to do something about what we're going through. And so our attention when we pray is our Father which art in heaven. The second thing, hallowed be thy name. That word hallowed means holy. We're signifying He's holy. He's righteous. He's just. He's it. We're the opposite of that. Our Father which is it. Holy is your name. You know what the angels in heaven are doing around the throne night and day? They're crying, holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. Oh, I don't want to think about the holiness of God because it shows how wicked I really am. Ding, ding, ding. And most people you talk to, they don't want to go to hell. They want to go to heaven, but they just don't want God to be there when they get there. They don't want God. I'm interested. This old cheap imitation stuff that's being substituted in our day. Our prayers should be directed Godward with praise and adoration. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then here this is, the third thing, thy kingdom come. I'll tell you something, church. We're not building an earthly kingdom. Amen. This is going to be gone one day. The building, the chandeliers, all the electronics, all these pews, this gorgeous pulpit, it's all going to be gone one day. This beautiful facility, it's going to melt. It's going to be gone. God's building a spiritual kingdom. And we ought to pray for that kingdom to come. What are we actually praying? We're praying for Jesus to come again. I can't pray that. Well, you need to get right so you can. Thy kingdom come. So, so far, our prayer should start, Our Heavenly Father, holy is your name, thy kingdom come. Oh, wait a minute now. You mean I'm praying that God's kingdom's going to come? And then here's the next thing. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Luke says it different than Matthew. I'm used to doing what Matthew says, but thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. So as your will is being accomplished in heaven, we want your will to be accomplished in earth. So here again, prayer is not us trying to change God's mind. It's us getting in tune with what God wants and start praying for God's will to be done. Oh, well, that's totally opposite way I've been praying. You've been taught wrong. You've been told wrong. A lot of people I talk to think prayer is just Jesus in a bottle over here. He can rub this magic lamp. You get three wishes and I get to tell Jesus whatever I want and I have this promise whatsoever I ask in His name, He's going to give it to me. Not if you're praying against God's will. It's impossible for God to go against His Word and go against His will. Hello? So prayer is more about God instilling what He wants in us and causing us to ask God to do what He wants to do. I talked to a lot of people said, Oh man, I just love to pray because I get to tell God what to do. <laughs> you lost your mind. You listen to some people pray in public, even in the church, they're sitting there demanding God to do something. Have you lost your mind? There ain't no fear of God in you. You need a checkup. It's appalling people parading around and trying to shake their fist at God and say, God, I'm going to make you do this whether you want to or not. You're a fool. And God save us from that religious monstrosity of a monster and becoming what we think we can control God. You're not. You're not. He's God. You and me are not. This is what He's teaching. Do you not see that? He hasn't mentioned us asking for one iota so far. <laughs> Prayer is about us praising and worshiping God. You want to know what worship is? It ain't hooping and hollering and running out. It's reading the Scripture, learning the Scripture, submitting yourself to Scripture. It's praying in the Holy Ghost. It is you communing with God, not acting like you're at a ball game. Amen. Amen goes right there. God has a specific designated principles on how He is to be worshipped and how He is to be prayed to and if we continue on in ignorance there's something wrong with us. So do you the first thing you do when you pray do you give God the glory do you pray His kingdom come His will be done? Now this ain't given for us to recite word for word like they do at the football team. 
That's vain repetitions. This is the guideline. Here's the outline. You want to know what to pray for? You pray to your Father which is in heaven. Holy is His name. His kingdom come. His will be done. What's that got to... None of that stuff has to do what I want God to do. Ding, 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 ding. You see how man has corrupted it? And made it about them. Isn't that what Satan done? He tried to make worship about him. He tried to make heaven about him. And Jesus told those Jews, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. Are you acting like Jesus or are you acting like the devil? Oh, now we find out who your pappy is. Now we find out who your pappy is. If you're trying to control God, you're acting like the devil. Amen. That's the book. I didn't write it. God did. So if you got a problem, you have to take it up with I'm just trying to get us to see both sides of the spectrum here. This is what God wants and this is the way we've been doing it. Uh-oh. So now what are you going to do? Are you going to keep doing it like you've been doing or are you going to subject yourself to the Word? If you're going to claim to be a Bible believer, you're going to have to submit to this book. And we Baptists are Bible believers. We believe all of it. Now, verse 3 and 4, this is where we get to pray for things that's in our life. After we spend the first part of our prayer directing our attention to the one we're praying to, giving God all the glory. Now notice what he says in verse 3. Give us day by day our daily bread. Oh yeah. So now, we're saying, Lord, will you give us daily bread? Now let me ask you a question. Is this physical bread or spiritual bread that he's praying for? It's both physical and spiritual. If we're going to say God provide for food on my table, what man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You need more spiritual bread than you do physical bread. I can tell you, I take in too much physical bread. And I wish I would change a little bit and let God transform all this into spiritual bread. Oh yeah, if I would designate that time, I'm going to push away from the table to get in my closet. It's called fasting and praying. And the early church believed in it. And I think it's something we need to get back to. So, He now tells us that we need to pray for this daily bread day by day. In other words, Lord, don't give me everything for the week. It means daily God wants to meet with you. God wants to commune with you daily. And He says, you when you come to God, you tell God about your needs not because you need to inform God of your needs because He already has, knows what you stand in need of before you ever think or ask of it. He knew you were going to have a need before you knew you had a need. So when we pray it ain't us telling God we got a need. It's saying God I need you. I'm trusting you by faith to meet this need. Yes. You got to understand in these days they didn't know some of these people didn't know if they were going to get a next meal or not. We don't have that problem in America. But they're asking for daily bread day by day for physical nourishment as well as spiritual nourishment. Verse 4 And forgive us our sins. Oh yeah. How many of y'all sin every day? If you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar and the truth ain't in you. So every day, I need to be going to God saying, Lord, forgive me. And I need to confess it. I need to name it. If I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Right? So why ain't we doing it? When's the last time? You let Jesus do a physical checkup on you. Say, Lord, here I am, examine me, search me like David did in Psalm 139. 
And God says, okay, oh boy, this, 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 and this. You know why we don't like going to the doctor? Because we don't like what they're going to tell us. And I think that's a lot of the reason why a lot of people don't pray and read their Bible because they're going to be scared of what they're actually going to find out. I want to know. I want to know what this book says. I want to know what God thinks about Daniel Blumen because my soul depends on what God says about Daniel. Not what I think God says about Daniel. Yeah. My opinion of me is probably a little higher than what God thinks about Daniel Brookman. And if you'll be honest, you'll admit to the same thing. So we need to ask God to forgive us of our sins. But as you ask God to forgive you of your sins, notice what else He says about this prayer. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. What does that mean? We're asking God to forgive us as we're forgiving others. And if you're unwilling to forgive others, God's not going to be willing to forgive you. Why should God forgive you when you won't forgive your brother? Your family member? Oh yeah. That's why he says when you come pray and you got a gift to give to God, take your gift and you remember you got all with your brother, go get right with your brother, then come back with your gift. Because I'm not going to accept that. You can't treat people like garbage and worship God at the same time. You can't withhold forgiveness and expect God to forgive you. Amen. That's close to where we're living. So well, you just don't know what they did. Well, you don't realize what you've done. You nailed Jesus to the cross. It was mine and your sins that put Him there. It was He experienced mine and your wrath. He experienced mine and your judgment. You don't realize what Jesus went through for you and me? It's just that personal. He died for you. He died for me. How dare I say I can't forgive? Whoever you can't, can't forgive hadn't done near what you did to Jesus. If anybody ought to have the right to hold unforgiveness, it should be Jesus. But He don't do that. Hmm. Notice what else it says in verse 4. Hmm. And lead us not into temptation, Amen. but deliver us from evil. So thus far, in Luke's account, when Jesus teaches His disciples to pray, He teaches us when we go to God in prayer, say, Our Father which art in heaven, holy is Your name, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. Give us bread day by day. Our daily bread is Matthew Cowles for it. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And then the last and final thing he says we need to pray for is for God not to lead us into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. So in other words, God protect me from what lurks out there. God keep me from being in a place where I am tempted, where I would fall. So when you, before you leave, this ought to be our prayer every morning before we leave the house. God, protect me as I travel. That's why we pray for traveling mercies and say, Lord, help me to be like you through the day and give me power over the evils I'm going to face today. So that's what Jesus teaches them about prayer. Now verses 5 through 13, and I'll hurry right here, Jesus gives us the parable of Christ that assures us that prayer works. Now let me just say this from the front door. You can't find you and God in this parable. If you try to make God being the man that's in, in bed asleep with his kids, God don't go to bed. Amen. God don't have to sleep. God doesn't have no need to sleep. So God's not the man in bed. And if you try to make God being the man in bed, you miss the whole point of the parable. So let's look in verse 5. And he said unto them, Which one of you shall have a friend? And shall go to him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, 
and I have nothing to set before him. So realistically, what's happening? What is? It's more than just this bread. Okay, Jesus is using an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning to it. What is the spiritual significance? I have somebody coming to me that's on their journey called life. They have a need I can't meet. <laughs> so I'm going to the one who can meet the need. Okay, that, That's the spiritual application. So I go and I call. I don't get an answer. Because notice in verse number 7. And he from within shall answer. Now after however long it says from verse 6 to verse 7 you're going to hear this answer and shall say trouble me not. Now number one God ain't never told nobody not to trouble him. God ain't never told nobody uh, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> Come on man. Where you get that from? So this man he goes to says, Trouble me not, the door's now shut, and my children are with me in bed, and I cannot rise and give thee. In other words, you've come at the wrong time for this man. So more or less, if you're the spiritual application, it can't be this is you going to God and God saying, I ain't got time for you. That's not the case. The idea is there's a situation you're trying to find the answer to, you're seeking for help among men instead of seeking from God. Okay, listen. This is the whole significance of the story. If you miss this, you're going to miss the whole point. Here's a man not willing to get up because he's already in bed. His children are with him in bed. And he said, I cannot rise and give thee. So what is the principle Jesus teaches? Isn't it sometimes when you and me go to pray it feels like we're just wasting our time? Would you be honest? I do. Sometimes I feel like, why not even put myself through this? I don't feel like they're leaving the room. I, I don't feel like God's moving fast enough. I don't feel I feel like God's turned a deaf ear to me, and that's not the case. Daniel experienced that, and he sent the angel and said, I heard you the first time you called. Amen. We've been hearing it. But I was hindered. By Satan. An angel said that. <laughs> uh oh. We're in spiritual warfare, folks. God knows the very hairs of our head. He sees every sparrow that falls. He knows our needs and He hears. But God don't operate on our time. God operates on His time. And you can't gauge your spirituality by how fast God moves. Because let me tell you why. They Sometimes I've got instant answers in prayer. And there's things I've been praying for for years that I hadn't lost hope in yet. Here's the principle. So he calls out and says, I can't. Verse 8. I say unto you, Jesus says, though he will not rise and give him because he's his friend. Now wait a minute. This man won't get out of bed because he's not getting out of bed though he's your friend. That's what he's saying. Though he won't get up out of bed because he's your friend. But well, watch this. Yet because of importunity, <laughs> persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he need. So in other words, what is he talking about? You just keep on hounding. Amen. You keep on that. And he's fixing it. Let me just read it. Verse 9. Here's the principle of this whole parable. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Verse 10. For everyone that asketh, Receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth, and him that knocketh, it shall be opened. What's the, what's the whole point of that? Jesus is teaching us to pray persistently. And if you look up these adjectives, these verbs here, ask, seek, and not, it's a continuous action. 
continuing to ask, continuing to seek, continuing to knock. For instance, hello, no answer. Hey, are you in there? And then you call them by name. So now you've gone from asking to now you're seeking because you're calling them by name. The most, the final step in this, and if that ain't good enough, it's you start kicking like a mule. You're going to wake the whole house up and the man don't want the house to get woke up and because you won't quit calling, because you won't quit asking, because you won't quit seeking, and because you won't quit knocking, he said he's going to get up and he's going to give you as many as you need. In other words, what's the whole moral of this parable? Don't stop praying till you get the answer. Now, now, we got to take the whole Bible. Okay? Paul done this. And he prayed three times for God to remove a thorn in the flesh, but God wouldn't do it. Why? Because His grace is sufficient. There's some things God's put in your life He's not taking away because it's helping you make you into the person God wants you to be. And without that thorn you have, you're never going to achieve sanctification. You know why you got faults, flaws, and fallacies? It's for your good and His glory. When I say pray do you get an answer, pray till God tells you the answer. And it may not be the answer you're looking for. We're convinced if I ask God, He's got to give. No, He says if you ask, He's going to receive. But He didn't say how you're going to receive it or what were you going to receive. We've implied it. Whatever I ask for, God's going to give to. That's not in the text. Everyone that asks is receiving. What does He receive? He don't tell us. He receives the answer. He that seeketh findeth. So if I'm looking for the answer, I'll find the answer. And if I knock, He says, well, He'll open up the door. But you may not like what you find when you get the door opened. Oh. Oh. So prayer ain't about me. No. It's about God. <laughs> And God's kingdom come. And God's will being done. And it's a way that we worship God and say, whatever you want, God, I'll say yes to. i say yes to. So, verse 11, 12, and 13, and we're done. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? So if you go to... So let's look at this. Or if he ask a fish, will he... For a fish, give him a serpent. Or if he asks an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? So, right the opposite of what he asked for. Would you do that as a father? No. No. So, verse 13, here, here's the whole drift of it. If ye, if you, then being evil. Oh, what? We're evil. Will you accept that? You're evil. I'm evil. If you be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. Okay? You're good to your kids. They ask for it. If it's, if it's really obtainable, you do your best to get it for them. Especially if it's bread, fish, meat and bread, meals, that kind of thing. You, you try to give it to them. And he mentions an egg. Sure, you're not going to withhold daily provisions that they need to survive on. And he said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? As I made mention earlier, Matthew calls it good gifts to them. Here Luke says the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. So what is the whole motive of your praying? Do you want God to take control of your situation or do you want God to do what you want Him to do? That's the whole moral about praying. Jesus said, I come to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. Jesus didn't come to live for Jesus though He could have. And why do you think we are to live for us? We 
We're to be living for Him. And this is what praying does. Prayer is more about changing you than it is your circumstances. Prayer is your way to get in touch with God and get on the same page with God. So what I would say to you this evening as we close is this. Follow this pattern for prayer. As we journey into Matthew's Gospel in the weeks ahead, he's going to teach us how not to pray. And then he's going to go with even more greater detail than what we covered. And I'm going to really break down the Lord's Prayer one phrase at a time. So we understand what God requires of us in praying.